Anyway, thank you all very much for coming. And no, I can't even say that I'm a constant, because although I worked on the committee that created the first year of the Freeze Lectures, uh, I didn't start in the moderating role for a year or so, I think, after that. But I know that one person who probably deserves that claim more than any other is actually our speaker today, mm -hmm. who appeared in the very first of the Freeze Lectures. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the series, it took its name when we were doing the centennial of this wonderful building from the names of poets etched around the freeze. And if you've never noticed, look up as you leave, and you'll see some great ones. Shakespeare kind of relegated to a back corner. Uh, Goethe's there. A guy that most people never heard of, Tegner, is over on this side. And so we decided to have a lecture series featuring August Nana faculty members talking about these, these great poets. And Dr. Roll Tweet was part of that lecture series. And here he is in the 19th season, and hopefully for many more to come. Uh, what is new, for me at least, about this is this the, first, this is the very first time in searching for something to say by way of introduction, I found a Wikipedia entry for our presenter. <laughs> <laughs> you know you arrived when you've made it on Wikipedia. <laughs> and it was leaked. It was a, it was a wiki tweet leak. <laughs> All right. Uh, among the other things you probably already know, Dr. Tweet is the first holder of Augustana College's first endowed professorship. Our first endowed professorship was the Conrad Bergendorf professor, Professorship in the Humanities, and he was the first person uh, to hold that. Were you not? Or no, second. second. Second first. I'm sorry, Dr. Dorothy Parkin was the first. Thank you very much. Um, I think, and this would bear some research, he's the only person to hold both the Towner and Studs Terkel Awards from the Illinois Humanities Council. And that's in part recognition of a way in which many of us know Doc Tweet, and that is through Rock Island Lines on WBIK. Yes. What, I, yes, that <laughs> uh, what I was surprised to learn, based on the wording here, is that he is currently part of the Augustan Historical Society. I think I meant to say a board member of the Augustana Historical Society, but he may have been personally acquainted with St. Augustine. <laughs> and so to be part of, rather than a member of the Augustan Historical Society, is august honor indeed. And we would never allow any introduction to be completed without noting his proud membership in the Sons of Norway. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Roll Tweet. Something about Kai. A few of you don't know him, and uh, here's what you need to know. Uh, his gift of gab was discovered early. Uh, one day when he was in first or second grade of Longfellow School, the principal called up uh, his mother and said, where should we bring the stuff? She said, what stuff? She said, well, the clothing, the household supplies, the money we've collected for your fire. What fire? Well, Kai, describe how the, your, your house caught on fire and you lost everything. Uh, he had turned a little kitchen fire, uh, which was easily put out, into a house fire that lost everything. <laughs> and they believed Kai so much that they didn't even bother to check on whether that was true or not. Uh, that has been Kai almost ever since. <laughs> there does turn out, however, to be controversy about the naming of Rock Island. Uh, first of all, the naming of Stevenson and then the changing of the name to Rock Island. Uh, it did take place, however, much earlier than 1841. So what I'm going to do today is imitate one of my favorite novelists, Lawrence Stern, who wrote a book in the mid-18th century called The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy. Uh, it was a scandalous book when it came out. It ended up being seven volumes long. Uh, and uh, it ended up being seven volumes long because Tristram Shandy could never tell why something happened without telling why that happened and then why that happened. <laughs> it begins with uh, Shandy as a young boy who has to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and so he lifts the window sash and pees out the window. However, the window sash falls on him, inflicting a very painful accident, <laughs> which influences the rest of his life, his opinions, and his life. Uh, but in order to tell us why the window sash fell, he has to explain that there were no lead weights in the windows anymore. Well, why are there no lead weights in the windows anymore? Because his Uncle Toby had taken them to melt them into cannonballs. 
Why did his uncle Toby do that? Because his uncle Toby was wounded in a famous battle, and in the backyard he's recreating that battlefield, et cetera, et cetera. And so it takes about four volumes for Tristan Chandy even to get born. <laughs> so I'm going back today at the beginning and then uh, ending with 1841. Uh, I'm going to try to do it in more or less chronological order with a few uh, little uh, side trips. Uh, and I'll, those side trips, too, have to do mostly with uh, the naming of Rock Island. I want to divide this into three parts to try to make it clear. I'm going to start talking about clearing the land. That's a satiric word, I think, because what it meant for the Americans was getting rid of the Native Americans. Uh, then I'm going to talk about settling in, the way in which white settlers began to encroach on those Indian lands, uh, and then end by talking about Rock Island County and the county seat. So let me begin with a date that probably is the most important date in the whole history of this area. On November 3rd, 1804, in St. Louis, Four Sauk Indians from the Des Moines River area, no one knows quite who they were or what status they represented, uh, met with William Henry Harrison, who incidentally is going to be the topic next week. Uh, William Henry Harrison was then the governor of Indiana Territory and also governor of the District of Louisiana. Uh, they were trying to get a friend of theirs out of jail. But somehow, after a little liquor and some other things, they signed a treaty giving up all the Sauk and Meskwaki lands from the Illinois River to the Wisconsin River. They had no right to do it. Uh, they really didn't even know what was happening because their idea of ownership uh, didn't include actually owning the land. Uh, but they, and, and for the next 30 years, until there was really a Rock Island, uh, that treaty was gone back to again and again and again to prove the legitimacy of our claim uh, on this land. What did they get in return for ceding all that land, plus an additional, as an aside, 15 million acres in Iowa? Uh, they got $2,200 on the spot, and uh, the Sauk Nation got $1,000 a year as an annuity for thereafter. Uh, there was a protection written into that that seemed to make it safe for the Indians to do this. Uh, and uh, that was that uh, the Indians could live on the land uh, as long as the United States owned the land, and furthermore, that they would be protected from the other Indians uh, the Ojibwe and the Potawatomi uh, and the Sioux who were giving them problems. So everything seemed okay. Uh, nevertheless, this came back to haunt the Sauk Nation time and time again. For the next 30 years then, uh, this bogus treaty uh, was used uh, again and again. Let me move quickly to the War of 1812 uh, against England and, and the United States, that split the Sauk nation. There was a party under Keokuk who was the real chief of the Sauks in this area, uh, and uh, Black Hawk who was a war chief. Keokuk, realizing the inevitable, took as many Sauk as would go with him and moved down to what is now Keokuk, Iowa, to the mouth of the Des Moines River on the Iowa side of, uh, uh, of the river. A Black Hawk, however, uh, not only refused to move, but he was engaged in two battles, uh, the Battle of Credit Island and the Battle of Campbell's Island. The Battle of Campbell's Island was the most significant battle, historians call it, fought by Indians without British help uh, in the War of 1812. So the two westernmost battles of that war were fought here, uh, but it did no good to the Sauk. Uh, it didn't help Black Hawk to win those battles. He was captured eventually, uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, in 1815, uh, the Sauk signed another treaty under pressure in which they agreed to move across the Mississippi River into Iowa, lock, stock, and barrel. Black Hawk refused to sign for a year, but eventually he did sign it, 
and briefly moved across the river, but he could never stay away from Saukanuk, the principal village of the Sauk, uh, where he lived and, uh, and had his PA. Uh, and uh, uh, so part of the problems was that, that Black Hawk and his particular group of people refused to stay across the river. In 1816, just a year later, uh, soldiers came uh, up from St. Louis <coughs> to Fort Armstrong and, and built Fort Armstrong along with five other forts uh, along the river. The purpose was not to protect whites from Indians. The purpose was to protect our fur trade from the British and, in fact, to protect the Indians from the encroachment uh, by whites, which was also <coughs> beginning to happen. Uh, so Fort Armstrong really was not a particular threat to the Sauk people. Along with Fort Armstrong came a sutler, George Davenport, who was an Englishman who in 1804 had uh, <coughs> broken his leg and uh, the English ship left uh, uh, America without him and uh, he ended up uh, joining the army and eventually becoming a sutler. So in 1816, uh, he came to settle near Fort Armstrong. He built a two-story log cabin for his trade. He was, started to trade with the Indians. And uh, uh, he will play an important part, of course, in the formation of Rock Island Stevenson. Uh, in 1818, Illinois became a state. Uh, the southern half was fully settled, the northern half was almost not settled at all, north of the Illinois River. Uh, but Illinois had enough people in the south uh, to be, uh, become a state. That led in 1819 to a, what is called the Indian Boundary Line by two surveyors, Sullivan and Duncan, uh, who drew a line that was supposed to go from the tip of Lake Michigan directly west to a close to the mouth of the Rock River. Uh, uh, isn't quite. That line was skewed, and so it they were asked to redraw it in 1821. Two uh, surveyors named Flack and Bean redrew the Indian boundary line. Essentially, that's the line that you see if you go to uh, the Augustana campus and see a little monument down near the slough. That's the Indian boundary line. It goes, it's the back of our property. It separates our property from the north side of Lincoln Park. It goes essentially down 9th Avenue in Rock Island uh, to the Rock River. Uh, that's the boundary line that becomes important. It was especially important because originally that boundary line was not only an Indian boundary line, but it was intended to be the boundary between Illinois and Wisconsin. If it hadn't been for some shenanigans in the Illinois legislature, we would be sitting in Wisconsin today. <laughs> but several legislators realized that that line gave us no access to Lake Michigan and to the trade to the Great Lakes and to the civilization that was coming eastward. And so somehow they were able to convince the government to put that injury boundary line not the Indian boundary line, but the line between uh, Illinois and Wisconsin, 100 miles or so north, uh, just north of Galena and Dubuque. And that's how we came to be uh, what we were. In return for that, Illinois uh, or Wisconsin got uh, a little more land that Michigan was supposed to get. And Michigan, not to be left out, was pushed down a little bit. And so the southern boundary of Michigan is further south than it was supposed to be. But at any rate, uh, we are in Illinois and not in, uh, I always used to tease Treadway because if the Indian boundary line had held true, those pesky presidential offices would be in Illinois and I could be in Wisconsin, <laughs> in the English department. Uh, now, uh, we begin to settle in. And uh, settling in is a long process because Black Hawk particularly, and many of the other Indians, the Potawatomi and the Chippewa, uh, didn't always stay where they had promised they would be. Uh, the first settlement in Rock Island 
the first, uh, in, in what is now Rock Island County, it wasn't even Rock Island County then, was a little village, if you could call it that, called Farnhamsburg. <coughs> Farnhamsburg was a joint venture between uh, uh, Russell Farnham and George Davenport, who went into the fur trade together. Davenport gave up his fur trading business and merged with the American Fur Company, and they built a log cabin to use as headquarters in what is now fairly close to 5th Avenue and 28th Street in Rock Island. You can see a plaque there uh, today uh, telling you where Farnsburg was. Farnsburg ran from there uh, essentially down to the river. Let me tell you one of my diversions, Russell Farnham's story, because uh, somebody, and, and uh, uh, I don't have the steam anymore, somebody needs to write Russell Farnham's story, either as an adolescent novel, I mean, I don't know how many writers are in the audience, but this you've got to do, because it's almost unbelievable. Here's how Russell Farnham got to Farnhamsburg. In 1807, when he was 23, he was hired by John Jacob Astor out east to head an expedition to the mouth of the Columbia River to build a fort to uh, keep the fur trade away from the British and the Russians, the American Fur Company. He set out from St. Louis with 70 men, blizzards and hostile Indians by the time he got to Oregon had killed off everyone except eight people. These eight people reached what is now Astoria just in time to see the ships that Astor had sent around the Cape of Horn to take them home disappearing in the distance because they'd given up. Uh, now four other people were killed and that led to leave three. One day Russell Farnham killed a Nez Pierce Indian that he caught stealing. The Nez Pierce tribe captured him and took him up to Canada. They kept him there for four years. Then they took him up to a Russian trading post in Alaska where he was able to wire Esther for ransom money. It took letters three years to reach Esther and return with the ransom money, which, ran, which Esther paid, uh, and, uh, and uh, Farnham was free. How to get home? He crossed over into Siberia, walked down through Siberia, across Europe, and up to the American Fur Company office in Copenhagen, Denmark, and said, here I am. Ten years later, Astor paid the whole 10-year salary to Russell Farnham, $1,400. And it is that $1,400 that brought Russell Farnham to go into business with Davenport, and, uh, and uh, for a while, Russell Farnham eventually ended up in St. Louis. So he didn't stay that long. He didn't stay long enough to, to participate in the uh, formation of other cities here. But other things are happening. Why, uh, when Illinois became a state in 1818, the, uh, the whole north of the Illinois was called Pike County. Just one huge empty lot. By 18, in 1827, Another huge county was carved out of a part of Pike County, Joy, Joy, Joe Davies County, with its headquarters in Galena. Uh, now, in 1828, remember that Treaty of 1804? The Sauk can live on their land as long as the United States owns the land. There was an easy way around that. The, the United States had a huge land sale in 1828, a land office sale. Uh, people bought up all the Sauk lands, including Davenport and Farnham. Davenport and Farnham together bought 80% of that land, including the whole site of Saucona. Davenport's claim was that he did that to protect the Indians from white settlers. But he may have had finance. Nobody really knows. Uh, it didn't protect Saucona from settlers very much. At any rate, uh, so in 1828 now, the land of the Sox uh, officially becomes land owned by Americans, even though uh, Black Hawk continued to live uh, in Saucanut. In Rock Island County, uh, got formed on February 9, 1831, 
as a leftover. Joe Davies County was being carved into smaller counties, and apparently nobody wanted this crazy strip of land that comes all the way down past Hampton and Port Byron and then becomes Lower Rock Island County. Uh, at any rate, the legislature authorized Rock Island County on February 9, 1831, as soon as the number of residents in the county reached 350. That happened a year later, and so the boundaries of what is present-day Rock Island County were set in 1832. It was divided into two precincts, or townships, upper and lower. The lower township was centered around Fort Armstrong. The upper township was centered around what is now Port Byron and what was the fledgling community uh, of Hampton. In 1831, uh, as all part of this deal, Black Hawk again agrees to move across the Mississippi River to Iowa, and he does. But then in April of 1832, for reasons that can be disputed, Black Hawk and his followers, including women and children of about 1,500, crossed the river at Oquaka and headed back toward Saucanuck. His claim was that he was not going to Saucanuck. He was going to visit the Potawatomi chief uh, up, river, up on the Rock River. Everybody here was afraid that it was war, and so they literally invented a war. Uh, there were any number of incidents in, incidents in which uh, the Sauk would have given up easily and gone home. Um, they did try to surrender at the at the, what came to be known as the Battle of Stillman's Run, but the frightened uh, soldiers uh, shot the uh, people who came to surrender, and uh, that forced Black Hawk to flee further up. It never really was a war, it was a skirmish. Uh, some people call it a massacre. But at any rate, uh, in the Treaty of September 21st, 1832, uh, at the end of the Black Hawk War, the Sauk were given until June 1st, 1833, to move out of Rock Island. Thank you all for coming in on such a beautiful day, but before we go, could we once again thank Dr. Rolfe.